thing in my life and my wife's life. She was a Hindu bowing to idols. I was a drug addict bowing to the drugs of this world. And God saved us. And within two, three years, I was already preaching the gospel in the nations of the earth. And, and God has taken me to many places and God has taken me to many nations to preach the gospel. As a young man, I stood before seasoned generals of God that pastor churches of 20,000, 10,000. But God put me on the same platform with them. Many, many big names from America that are preached with. And why am I telling you all of this? In all of that, I've come to realize that I am nothing without God. That's why today I want to I wanna speak to you about the God of Israel. I don't want to speak to you about the apostles of the church, about the pastors, about the bishops, about the archbishops, titles that have not even written in this Bible. They have come to man. Today I want to speak to you about the God of Israel, the God that is above all things, hallelujah. I want you to know this God that we serve. And many times our focus has been taken away from this God and put upon titles that man has put upon us. And we put our hope in our jobs and in our businesses and in our, in our ability to do things. But you must have that humbling experience to know that God is in control. Amen. So before I get into it today, I want to just share uh, the words of one of my favorite characters in the Bible, David. When he stood before Goliath and all of Israel was scared of Goliath and Goliath um, was trying to intimidate him. Have you ever been intimidated by this world? Intimidated by the need, financial need that's before you? Intimidated by the voice of man? People that have power in this world that use that authority against you? Have you ever been in that situation where even at work people with authority come against you? And David was in that place where in his strength he could do nothing. And Goliath was in charge. Goliath was controlling the hearts of everyone in the armies of Israel. And David told Goliath thus, And this day I will give you the carcasses of the camps of the Philistine to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the field, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. That all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear. In other words, God does not save with the might of man. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. This was the words of David. The battle is the Lord's. And this is where David found his faith. And this is where David found the power to stand and to face the intimidating voices that's all around us all the time. Hallelujah. And this is why, and I love it when, when they say the God of Israel. The God of Israel. And I want to paint a picture before you today, before we continue. I want to paint a picture of this God. Sometimes we forget this God that we serve in. This God that we came to bow before this day. And we read in the, in the first uh, book of Samuel from chapter 5. And we, we learn of the, the Israelites that, that were defeated by the Philistines. The Israelites were defeated. Understand what I'm saying this morning. The God of heaven was not defeated. He is never defeated. The Bible, if you read a few verses before, it speaks of Eli and his sons in the house of God. And, and he, he overlooked the sins of his sons in the house of God. And God said, I will vindicate you for this fact. And that's why God gave Israel into the hands of its enemies. But that did not strip the God of heaven of his authority and his power. Sometimes we as individuals, we sin and we do wrong things. And God removes his hand from us. And we taste the, 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 the wrath of this world. And we taste the storms of this world. But it's not the God of heaven that has defeated and given up 
He is still God. He will always be God. Do you understand that? His nature can never change. He is Jehovah El Shaddai, the Almighty God. It is man that moves away from the presence of God. And the Bible says, and how do you prove this? The Israelites were defeated. And, and Phil, the Philistines, they understood that the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. And they figured that because we defeated Israel, the army of Israel, we defeated the God of Israel. No one can defeat the God of Israel. And the Bible says that when they brought the ark into the land of the Philistines, they put the ark of God in the temple of Dagon. And the temple of Dagon faced the power of God. And the, the Bible goes on to say that the, the God of Dagon, the God of the Philistines, bowed before God, before the God of Israel. And out of the fear of the God of Israel, the people of the Philistines said, take this God away from us. We cannot handle his power. And what they have realized, we can defeat man, but we can never defeat God. And what you need to come to realize today, that sometimes this world will come against you, but it can never come against the God in you. You can fall short. You sin. And we all fall short of the glory of God. And we expose ourselves to the things of this world. But the God that we serve today, the God of Israel, He reigns forevermore. He will never be defeated. He is the King of glory. He is the Alpha and the Omega. This is the God we serve. This is who we woke up this morning. And to come into His house and to worship Him. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is not moved by the weakness of man. He will remain the same forever. The God that has promised you victory will always give you victory. The God that promised you healing will always give you healing. It is us that move out of the presence of God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrew that he is the same yesterday, today and forevermore. God cannot change. And the Philistines, they recognize this soon enough. We may have defeated the armies of Israel. But we will never defeat the God of Israel. This world may steal your cars and your houses. But they can never steal the God that's in you. They can never overcome you. No matter what you lose in this world. You will never lose your salvation. You will stand before this God. I tell you today by the spirit of the most high God. If you will love this God. If you will serve him all the days of your life. If you will serve the God of Israel. Not the God of this world. Not man. Not the titles of man. But to Today, I spoke your attention to the God of Israel. If you will serve this God, if you will believe this God, at the end of this, this earthly life of yours, you will live in eternity. And nothing can override that because he said it is done. Sometimes we get confused with our ability and God's ability. Our mistakes put us in the firing line of the enemy. You see, there is forgiveness in God. There is forgiveness in God. But there will be fruits of the seeds that we sow. If you, in other words, if you do something that is not of God. If you go and you, and you go and cross the line with, uh, with another man's wife. God will forgive you. There's forgiveness. God forgave David. But... The seeds that you sow cannot be forgiven because it's a principle of God. The what you sow, so you shall reap. In other words, God will not over will not cause you to you're gonna taste the, the fruit of the seeds that you sow. So we find ourselves in situations and we believe that the God of heaven cannot do it. No, he can do it, he's all capable. It is us that put ourselves out of the grace of God. You cannot blame God if you are not doing what he wants you to do. He's still God. The, the um, Israelites never followed what God wanted them to do. Eli and his sons did whatever they wanted in Israel. That's why the hand of God was not on them. It did not mean that the, the might of God was diminished before the Philistines. He was still God. The God of the Philistines realized that. 
And today as you walk with this God, as you serve him, as you worship him, as you bless his name with your life on the earth, he will never fail you. He will stand before you. All the storms that come before you will face this God. This is the God that I speak of today, the God of Israel. The God that's above everything, the God that was and is and will always be. The God that is capable of healing cancer. He's capable of raising the dead. This is the God we speak of. The Muslims speak of their God, but their God cannot heal the sick. My Hindu family speak of their God. They speak of their Hanuman and their Krishna and their whatever baboons and what, what they pray to. But when they sick, they come to the God of Israel. The same family of mine that bows to Krishna and bows to Hanuman. But when they are sick, Krishna cannot heal them. Hanuman cannot do anything. It is the God of Israel. They will still come to us to pray. But I always tell them that I will pray in the name of the God of Israel. Not in your God. I won't just pray in the name of God. Lest they take the glory of my God. You cannot pray in the name of God to heathens. They will take the glory. They will take, Dagon healed me. Hanuman healed me. No, I want them to know that Jesus is the only healer. He is the only way. This is the God we serve. This is who we woke up on a Sunday morning to come and worship today. We forget these things. He is Jehovah El Shaddai. He is the almighty God. He is Jehovah Nisi, our champion. He goes before you and he prepares the way for you. Hallelujah. You are not alone in this world. The God of Israel is for you. And don't you ever forget that. He is not moved by your sin. He is not moved by your mistakes. He is still God. Whenever you call upon him, he will be right there. He never went anywhere. He's waiting for you. It doesn't matter if we fall short, my brother and sister. It doesn't matter if you are facing difficulties in this world. Just call upon the God of Israel again. Just call upon his name and he says that he will answer you. And when he comes on the scene, giants get slayed. Walls come down. Hallelujah. Supernatural things start to happen in your life. The reason why we don't live a life experiencing the supernatural is because we're living in the strength of our hands and our minds. We rest in our ability. We need to rest in the ability of God. He can do everything. But not, don't feel bad. Not everyone understood this. If you, if you read in, through the Bible, there are many people that said, how can this be? When, when Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, he was the big shot in the Pharisees, teaching them all the word of God. And yet Jesus said, lest a man be born again, he will never enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus turned to him and said, how can this be? That a grown man will go through his mother's womb again and be born again. How can this be? Many people have said, how can it be? Because they, they looked at it in their strength. You may be in a situation this morning. You don't know how to meet the budget at the end of the month. You don't know how, how your husband is going to change or how your wife is going to change. And you're saying, but how can this be? And I'm here to say, with God, all things are possible. With man, these things are impossible. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, these things are impossible with man, but with God, these things are possible. How can it be that my child that is bound in drugs will be set free in the name of Jesus? Because God can do all things that man cannot do. And Nicodemus said, how can this be? But he understanding came to Nicodemus as he walked with God. You see, when we start the journey, we can say, how can it be? But there must be a growing in your faith and your understanding of God. Nico, the same Nicodemus that said, how can it be that a grown man can be born again? Was the same Nicodemus at the end that pleaded for the, for the body of Jesus. He went with the Joseph of Arimathea and he provided the, 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 the incense to, to prepare his body for burial. He became a disciple. You see, we must move from being 
a follower to a disciple of Christ. We must come to believe this God. We must come to a place where this God has reigned. The God of Israel. Not the God of man. Not apostles and pastors and prophets. We are nothing. We are just men. I am just a man saved by grace. I cannot heal your marriage. I cannot heal your finances. I cannot heal your home. I cannot bring children out of barren homes. Only the God of Israel can do that. My job is to lead you to him. We started worshiping man. We started worshiping pulpits. We started worshiping names. And we stopped worshiping the God of Israel. The church has to come back to the God of Israel. May all men not see us anymore. But may you see the God of Israel. This is the desire of God. This is not the house of Pastor Rakesh. Who is Pastor Rakesh in this infinite grace that I'm speaking about? Who is Pastor Rakesh? I am just a man. The God of Israel. He is the one I serve with all of my heart. He's the one that can redeem you. He's the one that will set you free. He's the one that stands beside you in the storms of this world. He's the Ark of the Covenant besides you. And when you realize this, you start to minimize yourself. Always when I raise people up in ministry, I always tell them, disappear so God can appear. Too many people want to appear. The army of Israel could appear, but unless the God of Israel was with them, they were nothing. I can come here and I can speak words of man. I can preach, I can shout, I can do whatever I want. Lest the God of heaven is with me. Nothing I do will count to anything in your life. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter who you are, what you can do. It matters of how much of this God is in you. This God I'm speaking about. The God that raised Lazarus from the dead. The God that split the Red Sea. The God that caused manna to fall for 40 years in the desert. Where is your problem in all of this? We think our problem is too big because we're thinking with the solution of our problem lies in our hands. When you want to solve your problems, they become very big. Goliath was a big problem to King Saul. But Goliath was nothing to David. It is time that man disappears on the altars of God so that the God of Israel can come and do what only he can do and redeem. If you read the book of Judges, it speaks of what I'm speaking. The church finds itself in the same place where it's about one moment the church called upon God and God delivered them. Then they, then they forgot about God. Then they got their promotions and they got their houses and they got their cars and their businesses and they forgot who gave it to them and they started to look into themselves and say, I'm, I'm the worshiper, I'm the preacher, I'm the healer, let me pray for you, let me deliver you. Let me deliver you. Let me pray for you. That's what happened through the history of the Bible and then God moved away and when the God of Israel moved away, the land was plundered until the next man and woman of God that put Jesus above all things, that put the name of the God of Israel before their own name. God said, now I find someone I can use again. And, and it went on and on. And that's where the church is now. We need to turn back to the God of Israel. We need to turn back to this God. We need to lay aside our ability. Then God can raise us up. Because if we raise ourselves up in our ability, it is subject to change. But when God raises you up, it is not subject to change. It is forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. That's why we bless today and we, 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 tomorrow we got nothing. Tomorrow, next week we blessed again because we're blessing ourselves. Know what is your blessing and know what is the blessings of heaven. Know when the God of Israel is blessing you. And when the God of this world is blessing you. We give glory to, to, to the God of this world. When Jesus blesses you, no man can curse you. When Jesus blesses you 
It's not about um, amounts and not about how much you got. It's about the grace. Jehovah Jireh is with you. That's what he was trying to tell his disciples. That when they were asking him, Jesus is a little trickster as well. Huh? He's always hitting them with curveballs. And he tells them, I want to feed this crowd. But he already knew that his father will feed the crowd. But he wants to test his disciples. He wants to see where their faith is. That they didn't ask them to feed the crowd. He says, there's a need. Whenever we have a need before us, automatically our macho-ness as humans come in. As men, I am the man of my house. There's a need. I'm going to do it. That he never told the disciples to feed the crowd. He just said there's a need. And in our homes, when the need arises, automatically we step into the picture. How am I going to solve this need? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? But God didn't tell you to do it. Step aside. And let God be God. Let God of Israel come and give you the solution. We are blocking God. And that's what the disciples did. He said, we have a need. Suddenly they come to him and say, but where are we going to find so much of bread to feed all these people? Their mind was not rigged up to the God of Israel. Their hearts were not rigged up to him. They, 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 uh, they default back to their own ability. You see, it's human nature. When you're facing a storm, you default back to your own ability. And in that moment, God moves out. He cannot come because you're not allowing him in your situation. And God told him, just give me what you got. I can see you guys. You all want to do everything. I want to try to teach you all that my father does everything. I do nothing unless I see my father do it. And he takes that bread that he gives them. And he gives thanks to his father. But that bread came back supernatural. You see, it was God that fed the people. It was not the bread. The five loaves could not feed them. The two fish could not feed the multitude. It was God that fed them. So it doesn't matter how much you earned. It doesn't matter how much you got in your hand right now. The need will be met if God is in the picture. It doesn't, I don't know how. And I'm, and I'm speaking many times, my wife and I talk. I was speaking to a couple during the week and I was telling them the same thing. Back in the days when God was, was building our faith so that I can preach faith. I can't preach faith if I never live faith. So as a minister, God must test me. And God must build faith in me. And when we look at those days, I don't know how we did it. I don't know how God did it, but God did it. I don't know how my wife supported a whole family of four people with 300 rand to buy groceries. And she still had enough groceries to give the people in the church that didn't have. How do you explain these things? When you disappear, God appears. And when God appears, the miracles of this Bible start to appear in your life. But as long as you are in control, God can do nothing. Hallelujah. It is not by our might nor by our power. It is by God. It is the God of Israel that will do everything that you need. Hallelujah. So stop defaulting to your own ability. That's where I'm trying to get you today. Don't default in your need to your own ability. May your default in storms be the God of Israel. Rest in Him. Trust in Him. And you will see what only He can do. You can only do so much. What is what? What are you coming? Why do you say that I believe this God, but you want to be the God? Rest in Jesus. Rest in the God of Israel. And you will see what he can do. Hallelujah. Let's look at it. Remember when the, when the Pharisees, when they heard Jesus talking, they said, how can this be? Is this not the son of David? How does he understand the scriptures so much? When God is in your life, people will look around you and say, how can this be? That this guy Edmund, how can it be that you can do this and this and this? 
How is it possible? I don't know how to explain this. Put the world into confusion. Put the enemy's camp into confusion. Let God do things in your life. Let him celebrate you. Let him build you. That the Bible says, lest a man build his house on the rock, Jesus, the winds of this world will shake your house. Unless God is the default, unless the God of Israel is the default in your life, you will always be moved by the storms of this world. It is normal. Throughout the Bible, people have been shaken by the storms of this world. Every man and every woman that has stood the test of, of time with God were men and women that learned the secret of walking with God. I am nothing without him. I cannot preach. I cannot pray. I cannot heal the sick. I cannot make my family everything that they need. Only God can do it through you. When you get to that point, life is easy. Life is easy. But the problem with us is, we want to do it. In the book of Exodus, God met Moses in the burning bush. And he told Moses something. He says, Moses... I have come in response to the cries of my people. Moses was not even involved in the plan of God at that moment. He was just an available vessel that God decided to use at that time. And God told him, Moses, I have heard the cries of my people. Come, I'm going to send you and I will deliver them. You are just a vessel to glorify this God. He just needs a vessel to show this world that he's God. But Moses spent all the time fighting with God. But how? But how God? But how can I speak? I stutter. But how? But God was telling him, I am I. What God was trying to tell Moses, Moses, you're misunderstanding this whole situation. I never asked you to do it. I don't expect you to do it. I am the redeemer of my people. God doesn't expect you to heal your family. You're buying your wife a, a gold ring and, and doing things for your husband is not going to change anything unless God comes and heals your marriage. Because you'll be buying rings all the days of your life and you'll be doing things for your husband all the days of your life. But when the God of heaven comes and touch your marriage, you don't need rings and silver and gold. You have the joy of the Lord. God anoints your marriage. That's what we need. That's what he was trying to tell Moses. Moses, what's going on here? And we are doing the same thing with God. God says, I want to bless your marriage. God says, I want to bless your business. But we're busy running around doing our own thing. And God's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I never told you to do it. I told you to trust me. I told you to move aside and let me come. Let me build again. Let me build a house that the enemy has broken. Are you hearing my sister? Let me build a house that the enemy has broken. And then I will build a house that will never be broken again. Hallelujah. Moses was busy. We are busy fighting with God. But God, but God, but God. But God is saying just move aside. Let me be God. Peter stood after the day of Pentecost and the Bible says that his shadow healed the sick. His shadow healed the sick. Who was in that shadow? My Bible says in the book of Psalms 91 that he who dwells in the secret place, in the, in the presence of the Almighty shall abide in the shadow. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. That was not Peter's shadow. As long as you are shining, it is your shadow. But when God is shining in your life, when you are nothing, the shadow of God follows you. And then the Bible says, then... Of my God I shall say that he is my refuge and my strength. 
The pestilence of this day shall come not near me. Though a thousand may fall by my side and ten thousand by my right, but none shall come near me. Only when God is in control. When you're in control, the storms of this world will overtake you. It was not Peter. It was God's shadow that was healing the sick. It is not me that preaching now. It is the spirit of the God of heaven. The God of Israel that is preaching to you. Without him I can do nothing. I hope all the young ministers in this house is listening to what the spirit of God is saying today. Then you will start to grow in the things of God. I hope all the businessmen in the house and businesswomen in the house are hearing what God is saying. It was not Abraham's business etiquette that blessed him. It was the anointing of heaven that raised his business up. Unmovable, unshakable, unstoppable for the glory of God. COVID can't stop your business when God's hand is upon it. It will, it will grow, it will expand, it will increase. When God told they, uh, Abraham, go to a land and I will show you, I'll make you a father of many nations. God blessed him in the land of famine. That even the kings, of, the kings all around were intimidated by Abraham. Are you listening business people? Your business needs the glory of God. Your business needs the hand of God. Not your might and your, your wisdom. All the business strategies of this world will bow to the economy of this world. If tomorrow the banks close, your business is gone. Because it was yours. But when God is in control, nothing can change it. Amen. And that's, why we, that's why the Bible says, bring your tithe to the house of God. Attach your business to the anointing of God. Attach your salary to the, to the anointing of heaven. It's got nothing to do with money. It's a spiritual principle. I hear people talk about tithes and offering every week. But it comes down to one simple fact. It is a spiritual principle that you are saying, you are the God that provides for me. That's what God wanted from the disciples with their bread. All he wanted was, give me what you got. Give me your life, God is saying. Give me your business. Give me your marriage. Give me your job. And God will meet the need. But as long as it's yours, God cannot come in there. You in control. You in control in your house. You want to call the shots. You want to put your strategies, maybe things that you know, that you read, that you read on the internet, how to bring up your kids. You want to you wanna teach them that way. But when you start, as Pastor Rishan says, when you start bringing your children into the house of God, you say, Lord, now I give them to you. I was speaking uh, on Wednesday night. I saw a couple walking out with their kids on their little babies sleeping after prayer. And I looked at them and I told them, that is the greatest investment you can do. I remember my girls. Today they, they stand and worship God, yeah, but you don't know where they're coming from. The only time they missed church was when we were not in Johannesburg. As long as we are in Johannesburg, they were in church. Whether they're writing exams or not, they're in church. This is why they are where they are. Not because of us, because of the God of Israel. We gave them to him. He's in charge of them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Give your children, give your family, give your wife to Jesus. May the God of Israel become the God of your house. And then you would see what only the God of Israel can do. This is why we pray. This is why we read the Bible. This is why we come to church. We made church for many other reasons other than the, the, what I'm speaking about. I come to church every Sunday. I don't know about what you came for, but I just came to glorify God. And in the process, he'll speak to me. He'll bless you. But I just came to touch the presence of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I hope this is making sense to you. That what I actually wanted to speak to you today, so that was my introduction. Now I'm starting my sermon. <laughs> now I'm starting my sermon. If you read in the book of Judges, there's a story of, of um, Gideon. 
I won't get into reading it because then I'll keep you here till afternoon. And if you read the story of Gideon, the Midianites were trying to attack uh, the Israelites and, and uh, Gideon cried out to God and God came to Gideon and God told Gideon, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. Use you, but I will deliver them. You see that? And Gideon now assumed it was about him. And he went and he brought a whole army of people around him. Thousands and thousands of people. I think it was about over 30,000 soldiers. And God says, these are too much. I can't deliver you with these people. And God started to sift that army of Gideon. And then he, he took away 22,000 soldiers. And Gideon, uh, Gideon came to God again and God said, still it's too much. Until he brought it down to 300 soldiers. And then he told Gideon, now I will deliver this people. What God was trying to show Gideon once again, he's the God of Israel. And then the surprising thing is, even with the 300, if you read the scripture, it was not the 300 that slain the Midianites. The Bible says God used them to do certain things. They had to blow the trumpets and scream some words. But God put confusion in the camp of the Midianites and they started to attack each other and they killed each other. God didn't even use the 300. This is what we miss with God. God didn't need Gideon's army. It was not Gideon's army. It was God's army anyway. God didn't need his, his 30,000 soldiers. God didn't need his 300 soldiers. God did it himself. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your holiness and your righteousness. He's God all on God all himself. We, we read the Bible not to show God that we're holy, that he will come and bless us. We read the Bible so that we become more like God. He doesn't need you to show that you are holy for him to come. Maybe you're falling short or something. Maybe you're not as holy as the brothers uh, praying or worshiping in the church. But God still loves you. He's still the God of heaven. He's the God of heaven. He's the God of Israel. And he didn't need Gideon's army. And God doesn't need your ability. God can come right now wherever you are, whatever your finances is. What I'm trying to tell you, you don't need a new job. What I'm trying to tell you is you don't need a new husband and a new wife. You don't need new children. You don't need a new car, a new house. God will bless you just where you are. Because it was never about these things. It was about the God of Israel. We made it about what we wear and what we eat and what we earn and what we drive. That doesn't change anything. God can bless you right now. God can give your business a million rand deal right now. Just like that. And everything will change. I was a drug addict lost in this world. And in one moment, God changed my life forever. And today I'm preaching to you. How do you explain these things? God doesn't need your ability. God needs your heart. God needs all of you. All he wants is that you trust him. I have painted a picture of the greatness of this God. I have reminded you of this God of Israel. That through the pages of history, many nations of this earth have encountered the grace and the might of his right hand. And that God is alive today, right now. That God that we read in this Bible, he's living today in you and through you. Through the mighty Holy Spirit. There's nothing impossible for this God. There's nothing impossible for him. We just need to trust him. Hallelujah. And Gideon was surprised. And Gideon probably said, oh God, you took away my spark. There is no sparks when you're serving God. There is no limelight when you're serving God. Always tell the worship team, this is not the place to come and shine. For the woman not to dress and, and act all fancy and all of that. This is a place to worship God. This is not the place for me to dress up in my three-piece suit and come and shine. Like a movie star. That's what the church has become. It is the place to lead God's people to his glory. It is not about us. 
people, brothers and sisters. It is not about us. It is not about your, your ability. It is about the king of glory. And when you come to this realization, then your marriage will start to grow. Then your children will start to be all that God called them to be. This is the way, simple way of the kingdom of God. The, the Pharisees came and tried to trap Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment of all? He says, love your God with all of your heart and all of your mind. And lean not on your own understanding. That's all, it's a simple thing. But we think we need to be holy. We need to quote the scriptures. We need to know how to pray. I can't pray like, like how Andre prays. I can't, I can't worship like how Patty or Edmund worships. God never asked you to be like them. God asked you to love him and trust him. Right where you are. What the way. Hmm, if you all hear me worshiping God, you will run out of this church. But that doesn't stop me from worshiping God. Hallelujah. God loves me just the way I can't worship like Patty, but I can. I love my God, but Patty can't preach like me. God's given you your ability. Celebrate yourself in what God has called you. Stop trying to be everyone else. Stop trying to be the next great preacher and be the servant of God. You know what God called us to be? Servants for his kingdom. But today, today, people want people to serve them. Today, the pulpit has become a place of, of status. But the pulpit makes you a servant to the kingdom of God. This is the secrets of the kingdom of God. I hope I'm, I hope I'm painting a picture for you today and changing your focus just a little bit. Hallelujah. Amen. As I always say, there is honor. Honor those in spiritual authority over your life. But you worship the God of Israel alone. Don't you worship me. Don't you put me in the firing line. Because when I'm standing before God, he's going to say, I sent you to lead the people to me. You led them to yourself. Please don't do that to me. I'm leading you to Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the God of heaven. The, quickly, and I close with this. Thank you, guys. The... Um, when God sent the Israelites into the promised land as the spies, and they came back and said there were giants in that land. There were fortified cities. And they said, no, we can't do it. You see, once again, they defaulted to their own ability. But God never, they forgot that they never walked through the Red Sea. You're not sitting here by chance. I'm not standing here by chance. I didn't give up cocaine in my, in my body just like that. It was God that, that redeemed me from that vicious addiction. Hallelujah. And these people came and, and they say, no, oh, there's giants and there's fortified cities. How are we going to stand against this? But God didn't ask them. He was before them. The cloud of God was with them all through the desert. Now they got to a place where they figured, oh, I... I provided for my family now. They forgot that they would have died in the cold of the desert if it wasn't for the power of glory above them. They forgot it was, if it wasn't for God giving them manna in the desert, they would have perished. Don't you come to a place, my brother and sister, where you think it is my business that blesses my family. Where you think it is my salary that blesses my family. Or it is my car that I drive that makes me above my brother that has taken a taxi. Don't you ever get to that place? Because that's where they were. And they started to think it's them. God showed them a point. When he entered the promised land, the first miracle he did was break down the walls of Jericho. And he never used the Israelite army. You notice that? God told him, run around Jericho, do whatever you want to do. We can fast, we can Hyundai, we can Kawasaki, we can, we can do whatever fast, go to the mountain for 40 days, but it's God that will deliver you. We think that our going to the mountain is going to cause God to move. God will move out of obedience of your heart. Out of your faith will move the hand of God. 